So, who's still enjoying Facebook? Anybody? Yes, yeah. How many of you, uh, how many of you enjoy uh, arguing on Facebook? Anyone? Facebook. I both enjoy ba baseball is fine and arguing in baseball is fine. But, hey, it, you know, there's rules and you can get thrown out, so. Um, now, Facebook. Um, so who, who has won an argument on Facebook? I want to know if there's someone who's actually made an argument and then you said, and someone said, you know what? I was really set on this. And then you wrote those three sentences and I've changed my entire life. <laughs> uh, no one? I was, I killed, I killed my, the search will continue. Um, But it points to a kind of a, an issue in humanity right now. And always, because everything is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, right? Um, and that is that we can't seem to even debate or argue or converse about ideas we can't figure out who is right. We can't figure out when an argument has won. We don't know kind of what is true. And because we don't know, um, most arguments devolve into, into a claim towards what I would call rights. I have the right to do this. Um, a claim towards power. I have the power to make you do this, or I will shout louder than you, or an appeal to emotion. If you do that, look at this person you need to feel sorry for, and since you feel sorry for them, your argument is wrong. Um, and this all points to a core issue, and that is that as a people, we don't have the same foundations um, that shape and guide our argument. If you say I have the right to do something, right? You're talking about something very secondary in your argument. What is the right to do this thing based on? And then, is that thing good? Right? Just saying I have the right to do something. And because the argument has broken down so much, and because we don't have same foundations for what we're saying, a lot of times we're arguing past each other. We argue for two different things against each other that we don't necessarily totally disagree on. And I'll give you a controversial one because why not? Um, in the debate on abortion, Right? In the argument on abortion, one side says abortion is wrong because it's murder. And the other side says, I have a right to choose because a woman has a right to her body. Whew. Those aren't the same argument. Those aren't talking about the same things. I don't think most people, there might be some people, there's always outliers, but I don't think most people are like, I'm for murder. I'm pro-murder. And I don't think most people are like, you know what? The problem is women have control of their bodies. Now, there's a few. But for the most part, we're arguing through each other, over and under. And that's like everything we argue about. Everything we argue about just kind of goes past each other. And so, because we can't connect, all we have left to do is use political power 
and protest. We have to out yell each other. What is right? Might. The, the strong is right. And it gets worse the farther you go from the person you're arguing with. And what I mean by that, the distance between you and the person you disagree with. Um, if you are arguing with somebody and you have to see them tomorrow, you handle that differently. Right? You talk about it differently. You treat the person differently. If you have an argument with someone and you care about that person, you handle it differently. The conversation is very different. It's not about ideology and politics. It's about humans. And we're talking about something like abortion, right? We're talking about a scared, many times, little girl who doesn't have support, not knowing what to do. And it is about that person, right? That's where our conversation is. And what is being asked of us is not how do we make the right laws? Not really, because that doesn't change people's hearts. What we're asked about is who is our neighbor? Who is our neighbor? When Jesus is asked by the lawyer, and by lawyer, this isn't like, um, like a lawyer like we think of. This is an expert on the Torah, on the laws of God. Um, it, is, uh, it is not the, the same thing, but what he's asking is he's trying to trap Jesus a little bit. Is, the commandment is to love my neighbor as myself, but who is my neighbor? In his mind, he knows who his neighbor is. His neighbor is the good, clean Jewish person. His neighbor is not the Gentile, is not the pork eater and the uncircumcised. And it is not bad, bad ooh. Um, and it is not bad Jews ones who don't behave and follow the law. Who is my neighbor? And so Jesus decides to teach him. Teach him a little something about who his neighbor is. Um, so when he teaches them who his neighbor is, Right, he kind of does what we call a midrash. This is kind of a Jewish thing where they like take a law and they tell a story to explain it. And he says, um, there is a man who's robbed and beaten. The road he explains is a thief. They knew, they knew they would get robbed. They knew this was a place of trouble. And on that place, he got robbed. He was destitute, he was going to die, he's in desperate need of help. And the people you expect to come by, walk by, and go around him. The priest, the Levite, a Levite is representing or the people who do the sacrifices and the temple work. And they go around him. And it is a Samaritan who comes and helps him. The reason it is important in this message that it's a Samaritan is because the Samaritans were probably the most hated people by the people of Israel. They're like half Jews. They worshipped God at the wrong place. They were considered unclean and they hated them back. They were kind of the people who were, when uh, the Jewish people went to exile and then came back to Israel, they were the people left over who had mixed everything together. And so that was like the worst kind of person. And so it's the Samaritan who stops and helps him. It doesn't just help him. 
but lavishly helps him, gives him all of these good things, right? He gives him oil and wine for his wounds. I don't know what wine does for wounds, but I imagine it's more symbolic. Um, and he brings him into an inn, and he pays for all of his care, and gives way more than he has. And Jesus asks, who is my neighbor? An expected answer, I mean, there's no choice. You have to say the Samaritan, the outsider, is your neighbor. And so when we're asked, who is our neighbor? It's not the person who walks around you. Right? It is the person who stops and helps. And there's a message behind this, I think, and it is this. You don't have a neighbor until you make the effort to love them. You don't have a neighbor until a person comes and loves you. Who was the neighbor? The Samaritan. Who wasn't the neighbor? The Levite and the priest. Who is your neighbor? Your neighbor is the one who needs you to love them, to go out of your way to show compassion towards them. That is not about politics. That is not about ideology. This is about being the people of God. Right? If somebody needs you and is in a desperate place, we need to find them. We need to care for them. We need to be neighbor to them. At the root of who we are and the basis of where our argument and our thought process comes about everything in this world is Christ himself. And this story is really about Jesus. We are the one who had been robbed and left destitute and dying in sin and death and all of the struggles and trials of this life. The priest, he who represents the priestly class, the teacher of the law, could not save us. The sacrificial system could not save us. The things of this world cannot save us. They cannot transform our hearts and our minds. But Jesus Christ, the good Samaritan, he who had been cast out, lavished good care upon us and saved us and made us neighbor and friend and family and then says you go and do likewise we can from a distance dehumanize each other we can from a distance push each other away. We can, from a distance, lay judgments upon one another and use all kinds of things, the law and everything else, to separate those who are our neighbors and those who are not our neighbors. What Christ says, your neighbor is the one who needs you or the one you need. Your neighbor first and foremost is Jesus Christ. And then it is this body in this world and that little girl who just needs somebody to help her. Right? That is our neighbor. My invitation to you Step away from the law, step away from ideologies and all the things that kind of move us away. And just ask this core human question. And it will allow you 
to connect. It will allow you to um, converse and to shape how you talk about things. What did Christ do for me? And what am I in turn to do for the people of this world? Who is my neighbor? anyone and everyone that God has given you. Not just to serve, but to be served by. That is your neighbor. And Christ has made you neighbor, and he has given you this meal, this food for the way. He has taken you in and made you his own. Go and do likewise. Amen.